Ever since the release of the original game back in 1987, Final Fantasy has gone on to become one of the most well-known video game franchises in the world. Hundreds of unique games have been released featuring the Final Fantasy name, and thousands upon thousands of different people have contributed to the franchise becoming one of the best-selling of all time. After the release of Final Fantasy XVI, total franchise sales have now reached 180 million copies sold worldwide, and with Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Final Fantasy XIV Dawn Trail on the horizon, it shows no signs of slowing down. With over three decades of history, it means the Final Fantasy franchise has plenty of stories to tell. In the past, we've pulled together facts relating to specific games, delving into a mixture of intriguing in-game oddities and curious development stories. Today, we're taking a slightly different approach, as instead of being hyper-focused, we're going to be talking through fascinating pieces of information that encompass the Final Fantasy franchise as a whole. And to kick things off, we're going to shine a well-deserved spotlight on Hiroyuki Ito. Ito has been baked into Final Fantasy folklore due to the significance of his contributions. He served as the director of Final Fantasy VI alongside Yoshinori Kitaze, the director of Final Fantasy Tactics and Final Fantasy XII alongside Yasumi Matsuno and Hiroshi Minagawa, and as the director of Final Fantasy IX. Depending on who you speak to, those four games represent the creme de la creme of Final Fantasy. That Ito was involved with the creation of all four, as a director no less, is pretty incredible. But his contributions go even further, as it was Ito who created the now legendary Active Time Battle System. This system debuted in Final Fantasy IV, as Final Fantasy was moving into the 16-bit era. It remained an active part of the mainline series until Final Fantasy IX. And even though its prominence faded amongst the main numbered games after that, the ATB system would continue to evolve with adaptations featured in Final Fantasy XIII and even the Final Fantasy VII Remake, with more pure versions appearing within spin-offs and sequels such as Final Fantasy X-2 and World of Final Fantasy. These elements have created an incredible legacy. But even though Final Fantasy IV would serve as Ito's first major credit on a Final Fantasy game, his legacy stretches back much further than that as he had actually been working on the series, behind the scenes, since 1987. Ito had joined Square towards the start of 1987, and he was assigned to work on Hiromichi Tanaka's B-Team to work on their Japanese exclusive adaptation of Aliens Alien 2. But instead of working on the MSX version, which was actually released, Ito was instead part of the team working on its PC port that would ultimately get cancelled. After the cancellation of that project, Ito tried to provide assistance wherever he could, becoming something of a jack of all trades. If someone needed help, he would try to make himself useful. That's how Ito got involved with Final Fantasy. As internal focus shifted, Ito joined the Final Fantasy team to help out as a debugger when development was nearing completion. But at the time, as quality assurance wasn't seen as such an integral part of the game development process, Ito was not credited for his contribution. Ito would then fulfill the same role on Final Fantasy II, again going uncredited. After the release of Final Fantasy II, Ito worked on Square's Tom Sawyer and the original Saga, and in 1990, the following year, he would gain his first credit on a mainline Final Fantasy game as he produced sound effects for Final Fantasy III. Having been impressed by his tenacity, the leadership team then gave Ito an opportunity. Based on what happened, we can assume Ito had been assigned to work on what was meant to become Final Fantasy V. Unlike Final Fantasy IV, which was being designed for the Famicom, Final Fantasy V was planned to be the first game on the Super Famicom, and Hironobu Sakaguchi had envisioned a game that was much more grand in scale and experimental. Ito worked towards this objective by proposing a brand new battle system that would still be turn-based but would have the illusion of being real-time. And this was all the more intriguing as his source of inspiration was not tabletop role playing games or even any video games at all, it was sports. After the Famicom version of Final Fantasy IV was then cancelled, and Final Fantasy V was renamed to Final Fantasy IV as a result, numerous game design concepts were merged, but the active time battle system was retained, and upon release, it was lauded. Ito then worked to evolve this system in the years to come, establishing himself as a core part of the Final Fantasy team. 
Someone else who was a core part of the Final Fantasy team, especially during the 8-bit and 16-bit era, was Kazuko Shibuya. Shibuya had joined Square in 1986, a year before Ito, and after working on a few separate games, such as Alpha, King's Knight and Rad Racer, it became clear that her strength was pixel graphics. For the original Final Fantasy, Shibuya worked on creating the sprites, and this encompassed the different jobs the party could adopt, but also the numerous enemies they could encounter. Throughout this process, she developed a strong working relationship with Yoshitaka Amano, and Shibuya even went on to design the game's logos, providing a concept for Amano to flesh out. Final Fantasy V would prove to be a huge undertaking, as Shibuya needed to develop high fidelity sprites for every job for every party member. And then, of course, there was the iconic party of characters that were created for Final Fantasy VI. But as Final Fantasy transitioned to a different style of graphics, Shibuya's role within the mainline games started to diminish. She did still work as a sub-character designer on Final Fantasy IX, as Sakaguchi wanted to get remaining members of the 8-bit era back together, but that would be her last involvement with a mainline game. Instead, Shibuya moved over to work on the Saga franchise. However, her association with Final Fantasy would not completely disappear, and as of 2023, she remains as the only member of the original development team who still works at Square Enix and is still actively contributing to the Final Fantasy franchise. As part of this, Shibuya has provided pixel assets for many of the new 2D Final Fantasy games created by Takashi Tokita and Tomoya Asano. She has also worked on the redesign of Final Fantasy V and VI for mobile, which was then ported over to Steam. Shibuya was also the person who came up with Katy Perry's sprite for Brave Exvius, and her most recent contribution was to return and redo all of the sprite work for the Final Fantasy Pixel remasters. Now, Final Fantasy II would be the first game to have a stronger focus on narrative. This change was driven by Akitoshi Kawazu with support from Sakaguchi and Koichi Ishii and it saw the introduction of named characters and the infamous keyword system. Final Fantasy IV then pushed these notions further, but the inspiration to make this change would come from an unlikely source. Weekly Shonen Jump was a very powerful publication, with a weekly circulation of around 6.5 million and a total readership of close to 18 million. Being featured in the magazine was therefore so significant that it could even trump the impact of TV commercials. For an upcoming video game, any kind of coverage was therefore of paramount importance, but as the editorial team had a very close affinity with Dragon Quest, they were quite disparaging of any would-be rivals and seldom featured Final Fantasy. Sakaguchi took this as a challenge. One of the publication's most influential figures was Kazuhiko Torishima. He had been working with Shueisha since 1976 and had been placed in charge of creating video game related articles. He was therefore a very influential man and would have a lot of sway when it came to deciding which games would feature in Weekly Shonen Jump. As Sakaguchi shared when speaking with the online publication What's In, he first met Torishima not long after the release of Final Fantasy III. They sat down in a very spacious room with just the two of them, and even though they did not know each other, Torishima spent approximately two hours lecturing Sakaguchi on why he felt Final Fantasy III was a bad game and not worthy of being featured in his magazine with one of the primary reasons being the lack of narrative and how poorly the characters were developed. Sakaguchi was incredibly frustrated by this feedback. He felt that games were meant to be enjoyed even without a story, and at the time, that was the general rule of thumb. Most games did not have compelling narratives, they instead left it to the player to fill in the blanks. However, there was also an appreciation that Torishima must have had at least been intrigued by Final Fantasy. He had played enough to the point where his criticism was well informed, and that meant that if he was willing to spend two hours of his day providing very detailed feedback, it must mean that he believed in Final Fantasy and wanted it to succeed. As Sakaguchi was also desperate to gain coverage within Weekly Shonen Jump, he decided to follow Torishima's advice. It meant that Final Fantasy IV, which as just mentioned started off life as Final Fantasy V, was developed with the idea of placing significant value on characters and scenarios. This would see named characters reinstated, and there would be a coherent and consistent narrative designed to drive the player forward without relying on gameplay mechanics that had the potential to frustrate players. After seeing previews of the game, Torishima was impressed by what the team had accomplished, but he was still not satisfied, 
and refused to provide any form of significant coverage for Final Fantasy IV. It wouldn't be until Final Fantasy VI that this would be achieved. Torishima liked what he saw and granted significant coverage in the magazine. This led to a serialised column where the developers shared fun facts about the game, and there was also a small comic strip created. V-Jump also produced a specific video that featured core members of the development team singing songs. The success of Final Fantasy VI then prompted Sakaguchi to propose a grand vision. As part of the promotional campaign for Final Fantasy VI, Sakaguchi had been given a chance to work with Akira Toriyama, the famed manga artist and character designer who had worked on Dragon Ball. Torishima had been the editor of Dragon Ball in its early days, and with Final Fantasy VI delivering on what Torishima wanted, Sakaguchi felt confident in approaching Toriyama with the idea that they collaborate on a new project. That project would end up being called Chrono Trigger. Following the release of Final Fantasy VII, the franchise gained success on a global scale, and that success was cemented upon the release of Final Fantasy VIII. By this point, Sakaguchi had moved away from making direct contributions to games, delegating directorial responsibilities to a few select individuals such as Yoshinori Kitase, Hiroyuki Ito, and Yasumi Matsuno. Part of this was due to the seniority he now held within the company, as he was expected to oversee the entire software library as opposed to select games. But it was also because his interests had changed, and he had become more passionate about establishing Square Pictures, an in-house CGI production company. Having been intrigued by the success of Toy Story, Sakaguchi felt there was an opportunity for Square. Pixar had stunned the entire industry by generating almost $400 million in the box office on a production budget of just $30 million. This was less than the production budget of Final Fantasy VII. Based on this, there was a belief at Square that if they could leverage their experience with producing not just CG, but entertainment properties with rich narratives, they could be at the forefront of an emerging and profitable subgenre of movies generating vast volumes of revenue for Square. To ensure that they were set up for long-term success, Square spent $30 million on creating a state-of-the-art studio in Hawaii. Construction was complete towards the back end of 1997, and alongside starting production on a Hollywood movie, employees worked on creating some of the amazing FMV sequences that would be seen throughout the PlayStation era in games such as Final Fantasy VIII, Parasite Eve, and Chrono Cross. The movie had the code name of Gaia, and its main protagonist would be a woman called Dr. Aki Ross, named as a tribute to Sakaguchi's mother. A huge amount of effort was placed on making Aki the perfect character, and this related to her physical attributes, but also her personality. This was, of course, to make sure Aki was appealing within the movie itself, and her appearance within Maxim's Hot 100 was a testament to the job the designers did. But there was also a secondary objective. Sakaguchi wanted Aki Ross to be appealing outside of the movie too. When speaking to official US PlayStation magazine ahead of the film's release, Sakaguchi shared that they wanted to make Aki a digital actress. In terms of scope, this meant they envisioned Aki appearing in other features produced by Square, such as commercials or even comedy movies, and that, because she was a CG character, they would have the advantage of showing her at any age in her life. Sakaguchi even noted that if they wanted, they could have Aki return as a 16-year-old girl. Ming-Na, who was cast as the voice of Aki Ross for the movie, was also open to continuing to voice Aki in any subsequent projects. However, those opportunities did not ever materialise. Unfortunately, the spirits within suffered numerous issues throughout production, and it ended up costing $137 million. At the time, this was an incredible production budget. It was more than double the budget of Shrek and it eclipsed the budget of other big movies at the time, such as the first Lord of the Rings movie, Jurassic Park 3, and The Mummy Returns. Needless to say, The Spirits Within did not perform anywhere near as well as any of those movies, generating only $85 million at the box office. It's estimated that Square had to swallow losses of around $100 million due to its dismal performance, and alongside shaking the foundations of the entire company, it also put paid to any hopes there might have been around the future of Aki Ross as a digital celebrity. Around the same time that The Spirits Within was being produced, 
Square had also put in motion grand plans for the expansion of Final Fantasy within the realm of video games. Throughout the late 80s and early 90s, Final Fantasy had been an exclusive property. Only one Final Fantasy game would be worked on at a time, and that work would only commence upon the completion of the previous game. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest served as an initial foray into producing spin-offs that contained the essence of Final Fantasy, and Final Fantasy Tactics cemented that such forays had significant potential. Both games were produced alongside main number titles by separate teams, with Mystic Quest being produced alongside Final Fantasy V and Final Fantasy Tactics being produced alongside Final Fantasy VII. It was after the release of both Tactics and VII that Sakaguchi realised the fanbase had started to fragment, and that those fragments had different expectations around what they wanted to see in a Final Fantasy game. To accommodate, Sakaguchi decided to create a more tailored experience, and this will be achieved by the creation of two separate teams. One, led by Yoshinori Kitase, who would oversee the creation of games akin to Final Fantasy VII and VIII, while the other, led by Hiroyuki Ito, would oversee the creation of games akin to Final Fantasy IV through VI. But going one step further, Sakaguchi also decided to create a third team that would be more ambitious. They would work on creating another Final Fantasy spin-off that had the potential to be massive in size and scale. At the Square Millennium event, this plan was revealed to the world, as Final Fantasy IX, X and XI were announced at the same time. IX would be overseen by Ito and Sakaguchi, X would be overseen by Kitaze, and XI would be overseen by longtime Square stalwarts Hiromichi Tanaka and Koichi Ishii. But one of the lesser known details is that another team was also conscripted to help deliver on this plan, and that team was helmed by Yasumi Matsuno. After finishing up with Vagrant Story, Matsuno was said to be quite demoralised. Even though the game had received stellar reviews from critics, its sales were lacklustre, and it represented a first commercial flop of his career. Wanting some time away from the spotlight, Matsuno was assigned as the development producer of Square's Play Online browser and portal. This platform was planned to have an intimate relationship with Final Fantasy IX, X and XI, and it was shown in prominent fashion during the initial preview footage of Final Fantasy X. In reality, due to issues around functionality and deadlines, that intimate relationship never materialised within 9 or 10, outside of course the infamously overzealous inclusion in the Final Fantasy IX official guidebook. In spite of this, Play Online would be integral to the success of Final Fantasy XI, and it's still around even today. Matsune would subsequently be assigned as the director of Final Fantasy XII, where he would work with Sakaguchi and Ito on a brand new Final Fantasy experience and the development team working on that project would end up being a fusion of his Vagrant Story team and the Play Online team. Sticking with the subject of Yasumi Matsuno, it's well documented that he would end up leaving the company before the completion of Final Fantasy XII. This was a rather unprecedented occurrence, as such a dramatic event had never really happened before with a Final Fantasy game. But in the context of Square, and subsequently Square Enix, it was not that unprecedented. Due to how much change there was at the company, many other senior figures also left, some voluntarily, some not. Tetsuya Takahashi, who was responsible for the creation of Xenogears, left Square in 1999, as he felt his creative freedom was being restricted. He would found Monolith Soft, and would be joined by numerous co-workers in this endeavour, including his wife, Kiaro Tanaka, and Yasuyuki Hone, who was the art director on Xenogears, but also had worked on Front Mission and Chrono Trigger. Shinichi Kamioka and Kuji Suda left a year later due to what they described as creative differences. They were both prominent members of the MANA team, and again left alongside numerous co-workers to found Brownie Brown, who would later be rebranded to 1UP Studio. Sakaguchi would of course also leave, having been forced to take responsibility for the disastrous performance of The Spirits Within, and this meant his role as the executive producer on Final Fantasy XII was filled by Akitoshi Kawazu. Matsuno would leave a few years later, with the official reason cited as ill health. He would be replaced by longtime collaborator Hiroshi Minagawa, who had been serving as art director on Final Fantasy XII. But this wasn't the first time a Final Fantasy game had seen its director changed. In 2003, Koichi Ishii, who had been at Square since 1987, stepped down as the director of Final Fantasy XI following the release of its first expansion, Rise of the Zillard. He would be replaced by Noboraki Komoto, who had been an event planner on Final Fantasy IX. 
Ishii would then be appointed as the head of Product Development Division 8, but would then leave Square a few years later to found Grezzo. Since then, Final Fantasy XI has had many more directorial changes, five in fact. As of right now, it's being looked after by Yoji Fujito, who serves as both producer and director. Nobuaki Komoto would step down as director of Final Fantasy XI in 2008, replaced by Koichi Ogawa, as he assumed the role of director on Final Fantasy XIV, but he would then find himself replaced again following its disastrous launch. Naoki Yoshida would take on the role of director, but Komoto would continue working on XIV during its resurgence in the role of lead game designer. Around the same time as these changes were happening with 14, Tetsuya Nomura would be replaced by Hajime Tapita as the director of Final Fantasy XV. This call was made by Yuichi Wada, and on the surface it seemed like a harsh decision, but Nomura had developed a close working relationship with Tabata in the preceding decade, with the pair working together on Before Crisis, Kingdom Hearts Coded, Crisis Core, and The Third Birthday. In more recent times, Nomura has also stepped down from directorial responsibilities relating to the Final Fantasy VII Remake. For its successor, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, he will be replaced by Naoki Hamaguchi, who served as the co-director on Remake. Nomura will instead act as creative director, overseeing the whole project and establishing how it will connect and interact with other Final Fantasy VII related initiatives such as Ever Crisis. As a collective, that means there have now been 8 directorial changes on mainline Final Fantasy games since Square Enix was founded 20 years ago, and 9 if you include Nomura stepping aside for Rebirth. That then brings us to our final fact, which relates to leaks, their wider association to the Final Fantasy franchise, and how sometimes things slip through the cracks that are so outlandish that nobody believes they could possibly be true until they are then announced later down the line. In more recent years, Final Fantasy has been one of the go-to franchises for leaks. The existence of the fabled Final Fantasy VII Remake was, for example, leaked by Silicon Era less than 24 hours before its stunning reveal during the PlayStation Showcase at E3 2015. And by now, everyone is familiar with the Nvidia leak, of which the vast majority of Square Enix's games have become a reality outside of the rumoured Final Fantasy IX Remake and the Final Fantasy Tactics Remaster. Final Fantasy XV also suffered from numerous leaks. Perhaps the largest and most pronounced was that large chunks of the story were posted on 4chan. This happened on the eve of Final Fantasy XV showcase during Microsoft's E3 2016 press conference three months before the game's initially planned release date. But there was also a lesser known leak related to Final Fantasy XV that was dismissed outright as being too far-fetched. When Kingsglaive was unveiled and uncovered Final Fantasy XV, it shocked audience members. None of them expected to learn that Square Enix were producing a high-end CG movie starring Aaron Paul, Lena Headey and Sean Bean. But there it was, and it was coming out just a few months later. But what most people didn't realise is that the movie had actually been leaked almost a year earlier by an online Chinese publication called VG Time. In their article, they revealed that the movie would be called Kingsclave, and that it would be directed by Takeshi Nozue, who had also co-directed Advent Children alongside Nomura. VG Time also revealed that Kingsclave would be a standalone movie, and that Square Enix were planning to release it a few months ahead of Final Fantasy XV, with it also penciled in to appear within Japanese movie theatres. The only thing VG Time didn't cover, and were instead speculating around, was the actual plot of Kingsclave. Nonetheless, it was a very thorough and comprehensive leak, but at the time, many believed that due to how detailed and specific it was, there was no possible way it could be real. A user called Crimson13 posted about the leak on GameFAQ, but it was shot down and dismissed within just 6 minutes, and after being posted on the Livestream.net and NeoGAF, it was just flat out ignored. That the rumour was dismissed so quickly, must have meant the production staff working on Kingsclave breathed a huge sigh of relief, because even though the cat was very much out of the bag, nobody believed it. And this all serves as a big and weird cautionary tale around rumours. It's true that we're in a very different space than we were 7 years ago, and clout chasing leakers are now a dime a dozen. But every now and again rumours that may seem beyond ridiculous manage to seep out, and sometimes they end up being true. And with that, they were 7 facts about the Final Fantasy franchise that you probably didn't know. 
please share in the comments below which you found to be the most interesting and if you enjoyed this video feel free to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more. If you'd also like to learn about the franchise in a lot more detail we'd recommend purchasing our book. It's called The Legacy of the Crystal and it contains information on 135 different games associated with the Final Fantasy franchise. If that's out of interest there's a link in the description below to our send out store. Alright everyone with that this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Adam Aguilara, Arguan, Benjamin Snow, De Livestream, Galsin Dikujata, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Zukun TDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.